God is good, amen? amen. amen. Church, now we're going to go to uh, the Gospel of uh, Matthew. We're going to start off at verse 28. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, chapter 28, verse 16. We're going to go through uh, verse 20. Then we're also going to flip real quick for those of you with uh, magic fingers, man. We're going to quick uh, flip to 1 John 4, 15, immediately following that. But it states, and it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And here's what I really want to concentrate on. And he says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. Thank you, Jesus. Then we're going to flip to 1 John 4, 15. And he says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides, God remains, God continues, God stays, is what he's saying. In him and he in God. Amen. Church, how awesome is it that if you simply believe, that if you confess and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then his presence, that undeniable, that unshakable, that stuck on you like glue type of presence is with you always. I want you guys to truly hear that and grab a hold of that because like I said just a minute ago, man, when you are in that dreaded valley, he is with you. And when you're on that praised mountaintop, he is with you because no matter where you're at, our Savior indeed is with us. Amen. I want us to truly grab a hold of that in life because I believe that if we could truly grab a hold of that, then we would look at every situation that we are in completely different than we're looking at it right now. Amen. Because we would know that Jesus indeed is with us no matter what. I don't know about you guys, but one of my favorite things to do is to scare people. <laughs> yeah. I, love, I absolutely love just to scare people, man. And it's fun, it's funny. And uh, if, if, if you work here or if you hang out here long enough, man, chances are you're going to get scared one way. We're going to hide behind something and jump out of something to scare you in Jesus' name. And it, it's just super, super fun, man. And, that's how me and my sister were raised. Yeah. You know what I mean? Me and my sister were raised, man, that if you could hide in the refrigerator just for a few seconds and because you knew mom was going to go to the refrigerator, then you would climb in the refrigerator. <laughs> now, you was hoping that sis would open and that mom decided not to go to the refrigerator anymore. But we would hide just in anything. We learned very quickly not to scare dad because dad swings. You know what I'm <laughs> mom was fun to scare because she would grab her heart. You know what I mean? You're going to take deep breaths and you're like, almost a heart attack. Bam! You know what I'm saying? High five and chest bump. You know what I'm saying? It was just awesome, man. And, and maybe you're like, maybe you're like my, my mom and you're incredibly easy to scare. Or maybe you're like Tyler who uh, is incredibly easy to scare. You know what I mean? But I absolutely let that's just so much fun. And no matter who you are, now you could think that, man, you're just so big, bad, and tough, and yet you don't get scared. And no matter who you are, if you watch a scary movie, and then you have to go into a dark room, or you have to go somewhere all by yourself, your mind automatically begins to run wild. That's right. Now, but you macho man, I'm not saying you're getting scared. <laughs> <laughs> but you be told, your mind automatically begins to run wild, right? And it's, it's absolutely crazy, but the very moment that you bring somebody else into the picture. Now all of a sudden it is completely different. You bring one person in with you, now all of a sudden you're not scared, but all of a sudden you're a prankster. But <laughs> right? you walking down the street, you guys just watch like uh, um, Exorcism or some exorcist or something. You know, now you're walking down the street and you're like, oh, man, that was a little bit scary. You're like, boo! <laughs> you scared? You scared? Say you scared. You know what I'm saying? Try, stop trying to scare your friend and whatnot, man, because all of a sudden now you break. Simply because you got somebody else with you. It's the human condition. It's called the present, the power of presence. It's knowing now that you are no longer alone. And when you feel like you are not alone, indeed your uh, uh, bravery level, if you will, goes up a notch. Because now I know that indeed I am not alone. Back in the day, man, when me and my, uh, uh, me and my boys were getting ready to do something dirty, and if we knew the canine police were going to come, we would always bring somebody with us who was slower. It was, nice. called the oh, it was called the presence of being quicker. Uh, and what we, what we would do is when they went, we're going to release the dog. Hey, go for it. You know what I'm saying? Wait, 
hey guys, nah, but take one for the team. You know what I'm saying? And that's the greatest compliment. They'd, they'd be forced to take one for the team because they couldn't keep up. <laughs> so it always makes you feel better, man, to have that extra person with you in church. Christ knows that. Christ indeed knows that when we are alone, we're going to become scared. When we're alone, we're going to become afraid. We're going to become frightened in Jesus' name. It's going to, some things are going to happen to us, man, no matter what, no matter how brave you think you are, no matter how tough you might be, there are going to be times in your life that you are going to be scared, whether it's in the dark physical or in the dark spiritual. But you're going to be scared. I know adult men and women who sleep with a nightlight because they're afraid of the dark. I believe that it's not so much that they're afraid of the dark. I believe that it's because their mind, they have not controlled their mind in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So indeed, their mind begins to go crazy because that's what takes place in our walks. When, when we're going through something or you could just be laying there and the enemy begins to try to put all these things into your mind. You start thinking about things that are going to take place to you, man, that would even freak the devil out. I would never do that. That's just crazy. You know what I'm saying? And, and we begin to think that as we're walking down the street by ourselves, I hear people all the time, I, I, I never go out. I, I, I won't go out at night the, uh, in, in this area or in that area. Why? Because in our mind, we are believing that all these crazy things are going to take place to our lives. But the power of presence. <laughs> Man, we need to learn the power of presence. Because sometimes, believe it or not, our wives aren't asking for our opinions. They just simply want us to shut up and stand there and listen to what it is that they're saying. Amen. Yesterday, <laughs> hello. Yesterday, we we're in the laundry room and me and me and wife are talking back and forth. You know, she's sharing something, and I spoke, and she goes, oh, "Sometimes, baby." I just wish you wouldn't say that. <laughs> just, okay. just stand there. Power God. You know what I'm saying? And true indeed, man. You know, and sometimes, fellas, man, they just wanna, they just wanna vent or they just wanna share. You know, their heart or, or they ask questions, but they're not asking questions. We don't fully understand it. It's a little bit weird. And if you're like me, man, you always have the answer. You have the I have the answer to everything. You know what I'm saying? So as I begin to put the answer in a form of a sermon, you know what I'm saying? And then she quickly, I don't, I don't need a sermon. I'm like, what do you mean you don't need a sermon? I got the answer. It's in the sermon. You know, that's what I do. That's what I know. You know what I'm saying? But praise God, man, Jesus' last words. He could have said anything. He could have said something so mind-blowing, something just that would make our jaws hit the floor, something so wise. But what he states is, I am with you always, even to the very end of age. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I have the answer. And the answer is simply my presence. And anything that you're going through, in everything that you're in, my, the answer to that situation, the answer to that problem, the answer to that sickness, the answer to that struggle, the answer to falling short, the answer to all of that, indeed is my presence. Amen. I will never leave you. Jesus, yeah, but what about mine? What about my mistakes? What about my sin? What about my attitude? What about my temper? My temple? And he says, yeah, but you know what? I will never leave you. Mm -hmm. Jesus, what about my problem? I got, a, I got a problem with drugs. I got a problem with porn. I got a problem with this. I got a problem with that. He says, yeah, but you know what? I, I am with you. I'm with you always. And what's crazy, man, is then we get connected to some annoying church people, man, who just think that they are so smart <laughs> that they are going to dissect the scriptures like they've never been dissected before. And I'm going to find out who truly deserves the presence of God. Truly, it's not those who struggle in life. Truly, it's not those, man, who, who, are, who are tripping into sin. But when I read 1 John 4.15, it lets me know whoever. It doesn't say whoever is perfect and never falls short. It doesn't say whoever dots every I and crosses every T. No, nah, man. What my word says, perhaps mine is different from yours, but I'm reading the Holy Bible, so I know mine is right. But he says, he says, whoever confesses 
whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God makes him his heart's treasure, lives his life for him, gives his life over to him, he says, then the presence is with him always. Amen. Can you imagine if we honestly begin to live our life believing that Jesus was with us always? Our life would be different. Our communities would be different. Church would be different. If we truly lived like we knew that Jesus was always with us, how many of us in here would stop doing things immediately? Look at that. Hands going up, but truth and deed, stop immediately. Because scripture says that Jesus is with us always. How many of us, how many of us in here would do stuff immediately and take the step that they know that Christ has been calling them to step? Now you may want to raise a hand. But true and deed, do those things immediately because scripture lets us know that Christ is with us always. He is always there. It's the power of presence, church. It's the power of presence, man, that, that makes you aware. That makes you aware of, of, of Christ being with you. You know, it, it, it's like watching a movie. You know, you might be watching a movie with your mom or your dad. And then all of a sudden, man, you know, it, it could be even be your favorite movie or your favorite television show. And the next thing you know, like uh, uh, a sex scene or something comes on. You're like, oh, wow, mom, no, we shouldn't watch this. Power of presence. Yeah. When be, truth be told, if you was by yourself, you'd be like, dang. <laughs> wow. I shouldn't watch that, but I'm going to DVR. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest with each other for a second. But the power of presence, man, lets us know that Christ <laughs> Jesus is there with us all the time. He is always with us. Think about how bold we become. How confident we become simply by knowing that somebody else is with us. Now I'll walk around, man, truth, truth be told, I will walk into any situation with my head held high and a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> because when I walk into a room, I want you to know I own this room. You know what I'm saying? I might be small, but I'm incredibly handsome, and I am fit like a, 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 a junkyard dog, buddy. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to come in there, man, and just, hey. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I'll even show my teeth, because that was all that scare anybody. You know what I'm saying? So you walk in there like that. But, man, do you know how much more confident I feel? When I walk into a room, when me and Pastor Rob have to go somewhere, and I walk in with Pastor Rob, <laughs> sometimes I think I even try and start something. Pastor Rob, he was mean bugging us, bro. I don't know what his problem was. You know what I'm saying? Easy, and he's like, dude, he's blind and he's old, bro. I don't think he was standing there. Just saying, I just felt it. You know what I'm saying? But it's crazy, man. But it's the power of presence, church. It's the confidence that you begin to have when you know that somebody is with you and they have your back, and that's what Jesus is talking about. Right. Can you imagine the confidence that we would have <coughs> walking into whatever situation we're getting ready to walk into, facing whatever the world or the enemy tries to throw our way if we honestly lived and believed that Jesus was that person? That's right. That if he was that person that constantly had our back, that's what the disciples had to believe. That's the power that allowed the disciples to go like Jesus told them to do. So many times the church world got it wrong. He says go and we stay. I ain't trying to be mean, but you know I've heard people say I'm, I'm in a biker uh, a Christian gang. Well, shame on you, bro, because I've seen an awesome ministry filled out in Vertigo and not one was there. Nope, not one. That's a shame. People are not going. They're staying. Mm -hmm. That's right. And Jesus Christ told us indeed to go. They knew that where, whatever they faced, wherever they went, they knew that Jesus was going to be there with them. They knew whatever he asked them to do, indeed they could go. It might seem impossible to us to make disciples from nation to nation, but indeed I promise you in Jesus' name you can do it. Why? Because he told us indeed to go. <laughs> Whatever he asks us to do, it can happen because indeed he has told us to go. Our worship team just sung it never once, never once did we ever walk alone. Never once has he ever left us on our own. 
Ask Jeremiah and Rachel. They had to learn over in Costa Rica right. the power of presence. That's right. That's right. They didn't have their church family. They didn't have moms, and they didn't have uh, brothers or sisters. They didn't have they didn't have anything but each other and the presence, the power of presence, Amen. Christ Jesus. Amen. The disciples, Jeremiah and Rachel, myself, Cindy. So many of you guys live life on a go, and to God be the glory. Amen. Because if you're living a Christian life that is nine to five, five days a week, you ain't living a Christian life. That's right. Amen. Because a Christian life, church, is 24-7 in the mighty name of Jesus, and you are constantly on a go. Despite what you do, you are an ER nurse or an ER doctor because you are always patching somebody up you are always breathing life back into somebody or introducing somebody to life. Amen. Amen. You are always there to patch up wounds in Jesus' name. That is indeed a life on the go. But the problem with living a life on the go is there are so many risks, so many challenges, so many setbacks, so many hard times, scary times. There's going to be times in your life when you're living life on the go that you feel all alone. But praise God, Jesus Christ knew that. I mean, have you ever looked at somebody who's not living for Jesus and you thought to yourself, man, how in the heck do they have everything together? Why does it seem like they don't have one struggle, one trouble? They don't have a care in the world. Everything in their life is getting paid. I don't understand it, but yet here I am, Jesus, living for you, and I'm struggling, man. Am I the only one that, that asked Jesus Christ that question? That's a true story, statement, man. Sometimes you can look at other people's lives and you're like, man, this don't even make. They don't even follow you. And they spit out children like crazy. They don't even follow you, man. They got money like crazy in their bank account. What's going on, Jesus? Man, it's crazy, man. There's an older pastor and a younger pastor who went out hunting one day. And the uh, older pastor, or the younger pastor asks him, he says, uh, so I ask you a question. He said, yeah, man. He goes, why does it seem like God's people have more struggles? Why does it seem like God's people have more troubles and trials and tribulations? Why does it seem like God's people, man, are constantly scraping by, having it harder than those who aren't even following him in the first place? And the older pastor said to the younger pastor, he said, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. He points off into the distance and he says, you see that animal? It was a dead animal off into the distance. He said, yeah. He goes, are you going to shoot him? No, sir. So the younger pastor asked, well, why not? He said, because he's already dead. Uh, and the older pastor said, exactly. We shoot the live ones. And he said, and so does the devil. Mm -hmm. He says, the target is on the live ones. Yep. Right. And the devil understands that. That's right. So yes, indeed. If you're alive, you're going to have it, and it seems like it's going to be a little bit rough. If you're alive, it's going to seem like it's a little bit tough. If you're alive, you're going to have a target on your back, and church, we've got to begin to praise His holy and righteous name. That the devil sees me worthy enough to put a target on my back. I don't care the slanders, I don't care the rumors, I don't care the lies. Put the target on our back in Jesus' name because I'm alive, I am well, and I know that my Savior King is right there with me, so it doesn't even matter. Because it is Jesus Christ is with us. Amen. That's where the power of presence comes in. Amen. God is not going to leave us on our own. He did not say, I'm going to be with you sometimes. I'm going to be with you most of the time. No, he said, I will be with you always, always. all of the time. Yes, indeed, in this world, we will have hard times. But I promise you that nothing can comfort us or give us stability like that of Christ Jesus. We find it in Jesus. Jesus found it in his, in his Father. That's why he told his disciples, and, 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 and he says in uh, uh, John 16, 33, in this world you have troubles. But be of good courage. Be of good cheer. Take heart. I have overcome this world. Right. But if you go back a couple of verses, go home and, and, and check it out for yourself. If you go back a couple of verses, man, his disciples finally grab a hold of who he is. And they're like, oh man, now we believe. <laughs> now you believe? So everything I've done up until this moment hasn't caused you to believe. When I raised Lazarus, you didn't yet believe that I was the Son of God. He says, but now you believe. Well, that's awesome. He says, but you believe so much so 
that here momentarily you're going to scatter and you're going to leave me by myself. But make no mistake, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. He said, because my father is with me. And I want us to grab a hold of that church. Amen. We are never alone. I'm so lonely. No, then you're looking at the picture wrong. Because you are never alone in Christ Jesus. It is absolutely 100% impossible to be alone in Christ Jesus. Because he is always with us. Now we see these stupid spiritual wing nuts who are so spiritually minded that they're no earthly good That's right. doing such stupid things right now in the Midwest. <laughs> Going to climb up to these tall trees with their Bibles <laughs> and bunkering down with all kinds of food, praying and praying and praying that God comes today, that God comes tomorrow. Shut up! <laughs> Can we pray a lightning bolt comes and shoots the tree down? I'm just saying. <laughs> Because it's absolutely insane. They begin to shut the world out. Yeah. Which is such a shame to me. Yeah. When you hear Christians, man, I hate this world. World's going to hell in the handbag. Well, it's your fault. Amen. That's right. It's absolutely insane. The things that we begin to do. Praying, God, come, come tomorrow. <laughs> when you pray that, you show me you really don't have the heart of the Lord. Because if he came tomorrow, there would be a whole bunch of people that would die and go to hell. And if you're cool with that, you ain't got the heart of the Lord. If you pray that, you don't have the heart of the Lord. Make no mistake, I'm okay if he comes tomorrow because I know where I stand in him. But there's a whole lot of people that I've been ministering to that I want to truly make that commitment. Amen. And if he came tomorrow, it wouldn't be possible. Amen. But we begin to cry out. God, end it all! It's so miserable! That's because you don't know who the Holy Ghost is. Because if you do, then it wouldn't be miserable for you. Because no matter what the world's throwing at you, if he is with you always, you get to rejoice. Amen. He actually said when he created the world, it is good. He loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son down to the world to save the world, not to condemn the world. So we are Christians shouting out that we want this world to end. We got to check our Christian card and make sure that we're still on course with Christ Jesus. Because if you cry that prayer, if you pray that prayer, then indeed it shows me that you don't have that heart. Because Jesus Christ has told us to go. And if the world ends tomorrow, how indeed can we go? Or if we're hiding up in a tree or hiding down in a bunker, how in the world can we go out into this community and honestly become a world changer? Jesus loves this world. And if you have a heart of Christ, then so should you. Yes, indeed, there's real pain in this world. There's real death in this world. There's real trials in this world. We don't conform to the ways of the world, but indeed we live in this world. Right. Hello. And if we live in this world, then we are going to face those trials, those struggles, those pains. We indeed will have those. But what's more real to us than the world we live in and the crap that we're going through in the world should be who is real in us. And I pray for you that's Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's the challenge. The challenge is to every day choose what is more real to you. The fact that you're in the world or the fact that you're in Christ Jesus. Unfortunately, some people who put the label Christian on their back are choosing to be more real in the world than they are in Christ Jesus. Right. But when Jesus becomes more real to you than anything else in the world, then it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It's not going to throw you for a loop. It's not going to cause you to sin. It's not going to cause you to walk back to your old life. It's not going to cause you to say, well, this person ruined my relationship with Christ Jesus. No, because everything that the world throws at you is not even going to matter because more real and more important to you is being in the presence of God, God Almighty 24-7. That's what's going to matter. Nothing else if he is so real to you. I pray in Jesus' name more real than anything that you're going through. 
that he is more real than your fears. <coughs> One of the biggest fears that we will ever face, which is it flip-flops back and forth to being the number one or the number two reason for divorce, is finances. It's absolutely insane. He tells us in Hebrews 13, 5, he says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. He says, for he himself has said, I will never leave nor forsake you. Amen. Covetousness, church. Man, it's things, it's stuff. It's a wrongly, the definition is a wrongly desire of wealth, possessions, and greed. The Hebrew writer is trying to tell us, man, stop lusting after the next big thing. Stop lusting after the next uh, iPhone or the next iPad or the next uh, hot rod. Stop lusting over the, having to have the biggest house on the block. Stop lusting with trying to keep up with the Joneses. He says, man, be content with what you have. Now, wanting those things are not bad. But when you become obsessed with wanting those things, right. when you become greedy, with wanting those things. That church is when you become wrong. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with having all of those things. But when those things begin to control you. I love what he says at the end of the verse. He says, uh, 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 because God is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Oh, wait. He doesn't say that. Actually, what he says is, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Jesus says the answer to even the things you want, the answer to your greed, the answer to your lack in your checking account, the answer to, to not having this, the answer to wanting that, he said, indeed is my presence. Amen. Because in my presence, you will have all that you need. Amen. Well, Jesus, man, I'm looking for, I'm looking for like a, a Matthew 6, 33. That if I seek ye first and his righteousness, then all these things will be added on to me. And yes, indeed, that is so powerful. But Jesus is saying, more so than those things being added on to you, is you simply standing in my presence. Amen. But Jesus, I need. Jesus, I need. Jesus, I need. And Jesus says, the only thing you need is my presence. Amen. To overcome fears, worries, anxieties, to overcome financial struggle is the presence of Jesus Christ. He, church, is enough. He is 100% enough. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Two Greek words, but they have two different meanings. We look at it, and, 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 and the Greek word actually, to uh, I will never leave you, actually means to let you down. I will never let you down down. Nor will I ever forsake you. I will never walk away and I will never leave you on your own. In my financial lack, he will never let me down. That's right. It's been proven time and time That's again. Right. Can That's I get right. a witness, baby? Right. Hello. Right. In my shortcomings, in my failures, he is always, always enough. He has never walked away from me. He has never left me on my own. Yeah, but, but, but my mortgage is due, but my rent is due, but my electric bill is due. Then guess what? Get in his presence. Amen. Because in his presence, church, it indeed is enough. And he is going to see to it that the things you do need, indeed, they will be given to you. But it all starts with being in his presence. <clears throat> Don't be obsessed with wanting. Be obsessed with wanting to be in his presence. Relax in what you do have. Yeah, but I, I, I just don't have enough of this. I don't have enough of that. I don't have enough here. And I don't have enough there. Yeah, but you know what? Relax. Why? Because. I love the way the message says it. It says that, that uh, 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 since God assures us <coughs> that he will never let us down, nor will he ever walk away from us. I could relax when I get my paycheck. I know I'm going to talk to some folk now. <laughs> I can relax when I get my paycheck and open it and automatically see that I don't have enough to cover everything that has to be covered. Mm -hmm. Can I get over it? Yes. But how awesome is it that I can relax? Why? Because God has assured me 
that he will never let me down. I can relax because God has assured me that he will never leave me. And he will never walk away from me. I can rest in assurance knowing that my Savior indeed is going to have me. Church, as your pastor, man, it is my goal, it is my desire to make his presence so real in your life. So known in your life. So felt in your life. So practical in the mighty name of Jesus Christ in your life. Even when hell is breaking loose around you. Amen. You can know him. You can feel him. You can taste him. Smell him. And it can be practical even when all hell is breaking loose. Things are going to happen. We got to get up. We got to get over it. Right. And indeed, we got to move on. Amen. Because before we are in this world, church, we are in Christ Jesus. That's right. Look at Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, man, who at uh, first was Saul, the man was, was out the Christians, man, having home invasions, ripping them out of their houses, man, allowing them to be put to death. But this is a man who knew the power of presence. For when he got into the presence of God, wow, God knocked him off of his high horse. He felt the power of Christ upon his life. We see in Acts chapter 16, man. Uh, 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 chapter 16, verse, starting at 16. You guys go home and read this. I'm just going to go through it real quick. But uh, 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 Paul and Silas now are walking around, and there's a slave girl. And a slave girl is demon-possessed, and she's walking behind them. And she begins to uh, 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 basically, uh, uh, um, she's prophesying, she's, she's fortune-telling is what she was being paid for. And she starts predicting the future. Oh, these are mighty men of God, and they're here, blah, blah, and saying all this stuff. Going on for a while. <laughs> and finally, finally, days into it, man, Paul had enough. And he turns around in Scripture. I love how Scripture says Paul was annoyed. <laughs> and he says, he said, man, come out of her in the name of Jesus. And what happened? The demon-possessed girl indeed was set free. Amen. And praise Amen. God. Amen. But the owners of the slave girl who were extremely ticked. But that was their moneymaker. Mm -hmm. So they go and they get the law involved and they begin to drag Paul and Silas out, strip them down, beat them like crazy, <clears throat> chain them, throw them in prison, chain them down. Now here's what's crazy. Many scholars believe that while they were chained down, they would have been up to their waist in sewage. Mm -hmm. Dungeons. They didn't have toilets. Hello. It was absolutely horrible. Paul, Silas, <laughs> naked, beaten, chained, sitting in sewage. And what do they do in verse 25? They begin to pray and sing out to God Almighty. Amen. Now I'm assuming by the response of the crowd, y'all didn't hear that, so I'm going to repeat that. <laughs> Paul and Silas, chained, Amen. beaten, yeah. naked, sitting in in sewage didn't cry didn't blame others but indeed they begin to praise pray and sing out to God Almighty I love the fact they didn't have a pity party truth be told pity parties ain't parties in the first place amen. but we love to throw them do we not but they didn't do any of that they simply prayed. They simply sang out to God. They simply worshiped the God they served. Why? Because more real to them than being naked, more real to them than the lashings that were on their back, their buttocks, their chest, their legs, and everything else, more real to them than sitting chained down in sewage, more real to them than the prison walls that were around them, more real to them than all of that stuff was the God indeed that they served. Amen. More real than everything else going on around them. This isn't a fairy tale. That's right. That's right. This isn't make believe when we read this. Amen. This isn't something that's so far fetched. Pastor Sahid is doing it today. Hello. Right. This stuff still takes place. We can't look at Paul and Silas and just think, man, that these were some amazing, mind blowing, magnificent men. No, they weren't. Come on, man. They were scrubs just like us. Amen. They had shortcomings all the time. Apostle Paul stopped talking to some of his Christian friends because of a disagreement. Wow, sound familiar? 
It's absolutely crazy. That stuff takes place. They had troubles too. Struggles too. Trials and tribulations. But through all of that, what was so real to them was the power of the presence of God Almighty. No matter what was going on to them, no matter what they were sitting in, no matter what was surrounding them, who they were in was more real than anything else going on in their lives, church. If I could have my worship team come up. I want us to grab a hold of that. Because if one thing don't go our way, if one thing happens that we don't like, then all of a sudden it's hard for us to worship. <laughs> Got to be kidding. <laughs> These men, not one time, were complaining and had every right to complain. These men, not nitpicking, finger pointing, bashing, and had every right to to do so, but they chose to sing. They chose to pray. They chose to worship. The only way, church, that we can truly live a life like this, in the middle of challenges, in the middle of struggles, in the middle of troubles, financial debt, in the, me in the middle of death, in the middle of crisis, in the middle of beatings, the only way that we can truly live like this, when we are waist deep in crack, the only way we can live like this is to know somehow, some way, something is more real to us than the crap that we are in. And I pray what is more real to you than everything that you're in, his name is Christ Jesus. That is my prayer. Paul is not special. I love him, but he's not special. He's no different than me and you. Absolutely no different. But he had the power of presence of Christ. And church, I'm here to tell you, so can you. Being in Christ Jesus was so real to Paul and Silas. And it just didn't matter. In the middle of chaos, they were still able to praise him, worship him. What's so awesome, man, is Paul and Silas eventually get out. And, and he was in uh, Philippi, and, and later he writes a letter to the church that he planted there in the book of Philippians. Twelve years later, after Paul gets out of prison, twelve years later, he's writing this letter to them, thanking them for a love offering that was sent in church. Here's what's so crazy. He says in 4.4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. There's that word always. I can rejoice in the Lord always. Why? Because Jesus is always with me. And if he's always with me, then I can always indeed rejoice. Because as long as he's with me and he's always with me, then I always have access to joy. I always have access to peace. I always have access to hope. Because Jesus is always with me. Again, I say rejoice, Paul says. But guess what, church? Where is Paul when he writes this? He's in prison. Amen. He is back in Paul. Rejoice. Your life is horrible. Your life sucks. And he says, no, you got it all wrong. My situation may suck. But my life, oh man, my life is absolutely awesome because my God is with me always, amen. And since my God is with me always, there is nothing that sucks about that. There is nothing that is horrible about that. So indeed, I can rejoice. And again, I will say rejoice. Paul, church, is not rejoicing about being in prison. Just like I'm not asking you to rejoice about your financial debt. I'm not asking you to rejoice about your struggles or your troubles, your trials and tribulations. I'm not asking you to rejoice about your shortcomings. But what Paul is rejoicing about, and what I pray in Jesus' name that you will rejoice about, is his promise. 
His promise to always be with us. His promise to never let us down. His promise to never walk away from us. His promise to never leave us alone. In this world, church, you indeed will have trouble. You will have hard times, sorrowful times, tough times, rough times. And while you are going through those times, the hardest challenge that you are going to have is knowing what is more of a reality to you. The fact that you are in the world, in the midst of troubles, up to your waist in sewage, or is the fact, is it, is it more of a reality to you that Christ Jesus is with you? That you are in Him and that He will never let you down. That He will never walk away from you. That He will never leave you on your own. Be in good courage. Be of good cheer. Take heart. Because Christ has already overcome the world. And I pray more real to you than the world you're in is the Savior King that you're with. Will you pray with me? Father God, we praise you. We thank you. We love you. We give you all the glory. All the honor. Jesus, we thank you indeed, God, that we can be going through some crazy situations. The world could throw all types of garbage at us, my God. But Lord, more real than the beatings that we get with rumors. More real than the lashings that we receive from slanders. More real than the sewage that we're sitting in. The, the financial shortage that we're coming upon. Bills being due, mortgage not getting paid, rent not getting paid, bills not getting paid, food not getting put on the table. Addictions trying to overrun us like crazy, but more real than all of that is the fact, Jesus, that you are always, always with us. Not some of the times, not most of the times, but Jesus, you are always with us. So Lord, I pray right now over each person under the sound of my voice that today when they walk out of here, Jesus, they will know that they're not leaving your presence, but indeed your presence is walking out with them as well. Because you are always with them. When they're in the school, you are with them. When they're at home, you are with them. When they're in the workplace, you are with them. When you're in a bike rally, you are with them. When they're ministering to lost loved ones, you are with them, Jesus. When their face is down in a pillow, crying because of depression, you are with them. I pray right now. Does anybody in here who don't know Jesus, but you want to be him? Church, I promise you, he wants to be with you always. Well, how do I get that? We confess. We confess that He is the Son of God. We believe in our heart. We ask Him to be our Son. And we know that we serve a God who cannot lie. And He says simply that if we do those, then He is with us always. He abides in us. He continues. He stays. He sticks to us like good. So if that's you, I'm going to simply ask you to open up your heart, right where you're sitting. I'm going to have everybody repeat this prayer after me. And what we're going to do in this prayer is we're going to confess that we've sinned. We're going to confess that we're, we have fallen short. And we're going to believe that Jesus is our Savior, the Son of God. We're going to make Him our everything, our heart's treasure. If that's you, repeat after me. Everybody. Say, Father God, Father God, in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus I need a Savior. For I've sinned. I know there's only one who can forgive me. Only one who can save me. Only one who can redeem me. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, forgive me, restore me, renew me, refresh me, redeem me. Say thank you, Jesus, that I now stand redeemed forgiven, 
I'm saved. I am brand new. I'm turning from my old ways and following you. Lead God, direct me. Protect me. Say, Holy Ghost, here I am. Fill me up to be a living sacrifice to King Jesus. All God's kids said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, stand to your feet if you will, please, as we enter into worship.